right, so uh, thanks so much for taking the time um, to come out today. Um, on behalf of um, Congressman Chris Van Hollen and Congressman Dave Riker, uh, we are the co-chairs of the uh, House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. Uh, my name is Bill Parsons. I'm the Congressman's Chief of Staff. And for Congressman Riker, I'm here with my colleague Ashley Johnson, who's my opposite um, on the Republican side for this session of Congress. Um, it's a pleasure to partner, uh, as always, with Carol Werner and ESI uh, on this year's annual uh, EERE budget briefing. Uh, so we want to thank you for taking the time to come out today. Uh, just a word about the caucus. Uh, it is one of the longest continuously running caucuses um, in the House of Representatives, certainly the longest continuously running uh, caucus with a focus on uh, clean energy. Uh, north of 15 years in running. Um, we currently have 157 members that we've got uh, uh, Kirsten Cinema uh, last week. She's our most recent member, uh, covering 39 states, D.C., and three territories. Um, is today and has always been, I would say, bipartisan, but I don't I even go so far as to say nonpartisan. This is a forum for any member office who has an interest uh, in these issues. Uh, we offer a uh, two weekly services. There's a clip service as well as an events calendar. Uh, we are always looking for new members, so if you're here from a member office, I uh, uh, hope you will uh, uh, consider joining. Um, and uh, we have two signature uh, kind of events a year. Um, this is the first. We always do uh, a budget briefing, and I want to extend my appreciation to the panelists for taking time out of their uh, schedules to be here. This is the time when I, I always, if I haven't yet, wrap my head all the way around uh, where these issues are in terms of the current budget year. This is where I get that done. So if that's what, you, that's what you're interested in, that's why you came for, you're in the right place. Uh, and the second uh, signature uh, event we do every year is um, uh, our uh, Expo uh, Plus Forum. Uh, there's a day-long series of uh, forums and breakout sessions that goes along with the Expo in the Cannon Caucus Room. This year's expo is scheduled for Wednesday, June 12th. So if that's of interest, please do put that on your calendar. And uh, since uh, we're uh, very pleased to have Mr. Riker join us this year, new as the Republican co-chair, let me just uh, give it to Ashley for a few words. Um, on behalf of the Congressman, I first want to thank all of our presenters today for coming out and just reiterate what Bill uh, said so nicely about uh, this not being a partisan caucus. Um, and we certainly hope that any of you who Maybe in the audience today, who work for members who have not yet joined, uh, definitely encourage um, more membership. And um, I'm yeah, just excited to be able to help facilitate uh, this event today so that we can all learn more about um, what is in the budget. So, thank you. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carol Werner from ESI, who's going to moderate this afternoon's event. Thanks very much, Bill and Ashley. And it is always uh, a pleasure to be working with uh, Bill and Ashley and their bosses with regard to the caucus on the House side. And there is also uh, a Renewables and Efficiency Caucus on the Senate side as well, with whom we work, and which will also be involved with the expo that Bill was talking about that is scheduled for June 12th. The, it's very important for us, I think, to really be able to take a look at the budget because budget really does represent policy, represents direction. Um, it's a chance to kind of look at what has been happening, uh, what kind of progress has been made, as well as what that means in terms of thinking about future priorities that the administration is putting out for the Hill to consider. This year, as we know, both the House and the Senate have already uh, gone through and issued their respective budget resolutions. We do not know where that will um, will exactly head, but but that that is a very very important uh, part of the whole process as well. And so today, what we're going to do is we will hear first from J Jason Walsh, who is senior advisor at the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the Department of Energy to kind of lay out the department priorities 
uh, and look at some of those accomplishments for efficiency and renewables since clean energy and its many attributes that affect our energy, our economy, our security, public health, all of these things are very important. And then we will turn to um, Francis Seen with the Library of Congress, uh, the Congressional Research Service, uh, and will be followed by Scott Sklar, uh, who is a colleague with me on the Sustainable Energy Coalition Steering Committee. Jason.
uh, some of these numbers. In particular, the fact that private sector investment in energy R&D is only 0.42% uh, of sales. That's less than half of 1%. Uh, now, when we look across other major sectors of the national economy, uh, like pharmaceuticals at 20.5 percent or aerospace uh, at 11.5 percent, we see uh, a pretty significant gulf. So to our minds, the lesson of, of these numbers is fairly clear. The private sector, again for a set of reasons, systematically underinvests in energy R&D. And therefore, uh, we need smart and strategic federal investment. Uh, to fill some of that gap if the U.S. is to remain competitive. Uh, at ERE, we have a commitment to high-impact work with high-impact results. With every decision we make, uh, we first ask ourselves uh, what we call the five ERE core questions to guide our decision making. And these questions include, is this a high-impact problem? Uh, how is EERE funding making a large impact to accelerate technology development and deployment compared to what folks in the industry are already doing? And how will this funding result in enduring economic benefit to the United States? Uh, we ask these questions because we want to ensure that every tax dollar we spend uh, is pointed at the most high impact uh, problems that we can solve. We've got, I think, a, a pretty long and impressive track record of success uh, that uh, I will only give a couple of examples of for lack of time. Um, but let, let me note just a couple. Over a 20-year period, EDRA funded um, combustion R&D on heavy-duty trucking efficiency resulted in a net benefit of more than $70 billion. That's a, a, a roughly 75 to 1 return on investment and ROI that I think any company would be proud of. Um, virtually, virtually every hybrid electric vehicle has EERE battery technology inside. Uh, our research has helped reduce plug-in electric vehicle battery costs by 50% over the past four years, reduced fuel cell costs by 35% over the past five years, uh, and the list goes on. Um, we think that we're in a very unique time and place uh, for American clean energy. We have made tremendous progress uh, over the last several years and last decade. And we are now in a kind of unprecedented position where a wide array of the technologies we work on are within five to ten years of being directly cost competitive with traditional forms of energy. This presents us um, not only with an opportunity to address America's strategic energy challenges, but also sees a, a really fantastic economic opportunity. Um, in 2012 alone, $268 billion was invested globally in clean energy, and trillions more will be invested uh, in the coming years. So at, at DOE, we, we really believe we face a stark choice. We can either make the necessary investments to ensure that the clean energy technologies of today and tomorrow are invented and manufactured here in the United States, or we can surrender global leadership and import those technologies from other nations. Okay, let me talk in, in some detail about our 2014 budget request. Um, it is $2.78 billion for fiscal year 2014. Uh, this funding will support research, development, and deployment of technologies within each of EERE's uh, three sectors. Sustainable transportation, for which we request $957 million across three technology offices, where our focus is on providing American consumers and industry with more and better choices uh, on, on, about how they fuel and power their vehicles uh, and their businesses. Uh, energy saving homes, buildings, and manufacturing, for which we request $949 million across four offices, 
where our focus is on reducing the amount of energy that is wasted in our homes, uh, in our buildings, and uh, in increasing the competitiveness of U.S. manufacturing by uh, helping U.S. manufacturers achieve greater energy productivity. And finally, renewable electricity generation, for which we request $615.5 million across four offices, where our focus is on squeezing more usable power uh, out of these technologies while improving the economics of manufacturing and installation. Um, this slide shows the request in more detail. Uh, I believe you've got a handout provided by EESI. Uh, I won't try to go through this line by line. I will say that the, the FY14 budget request for EERE represents a, a, a pretty significant increase in funding. Uh, from the annual ICR under which uh, we're on, on under right now, which, which is, represents about a 52.5% increase. And even from the FY13 request, uh, about a 22.4% increase. Given the fiscal challenges we face as a nation, the fact that the President is requesting this level of funding increase for EERE demonstrates, I think, what a priority it is for this president that we win this clean energy race uh, and greater economic and, and, and greater energy independence. Uh, this um, also, I think, is worth looking at over the last several years, um, and, and I think you'll see the prioritization of, of clean energy investment has. Uh, uh, really seen a major increase in the ERE budget when we were starting in FY 2010. Uh, it, I will say over the same period, appropriations from Congress have fallen short of those requests. Um, and one of the lessons we derive from this trend is that uh, opportunities like this uh, today, courtesy of uh, EESI, where we can educate people about what we do and why we do it are uh, extremely important. Let me talk a little bit about uh, cross-cutting EERE initiatives, um, which, uh, to our minds, align and leverage a, a, a bunch of work that we do across our different technology offices. I'll start with one that I think is, is familiar to many of you, uh, which is our Sunshot initiative. Um, FY14 funding will uh, support this ongoing initiative to help solar energy uh, become cost competitive with traditional forms of energy, and in particular um, with the goal of getting solar electricity prices down to a dollar uh, a watt. Um, our efforts have catalyzed growth in a sector that has more than doubled the U.S. supply of solar electricity since 2009, cut the overall system costs uh, in half, and, and a sector that has grown to employ more than 100,000 people. Um, this is, uh, I think, a really impressive story in a lot of ways. I, I will say it's worth noting that probably the most comprehensive third-party evaluation of the impacts uh, of our offices has been done on our solar technologies office. And that evaluation found that, that uh, EERE's $3.7 billion of investment in solar PV R&D over a three-decade period resulted in a net economic benefit of $15 billion due to module efficiency and reliability improvements, and at the same time, advanced the industry about 12 years from where it would have been absent EERE investments, which we consider to be a fairly impressive validation of, of the work that's been done over, uh, over a number of years. The EV Everywhere Grand Challenge, uh, which um, some of you may know was the first of the Obama administration's grand challenges. Uh, this uh, challenge uh, is focused on uh, making sure that American companies are the first in the world to produce electric vehicles that are at least as affordable and convenient uh, for the average American family as today's gasoline-powered vehicles by 2022. Now, I, I should know that most of this work is done out of our vehicle technologies office, which continues to pursue a portfolio of technologies that collectively can reduce our dependence on, on oil. Um, 
but it, it is quite clear to us that vehicle electrification uh, is uh, an essential and significant part of the solution that we're trying to work with. And it's uh, where the global automotive industry is already moving. Um, we think it's important for national security and national economy reasons. It also benefits individual consumers. Uh, today's electric vehicles can fuel uh, for the equivalent of about a dollar a gallon. Uh, and the next generation of these vehicles will bring even bigger savings. And in an era of four dollar a gallon gasoline, we think that is significant. Last month, uh, we launched uh, EERE's new Clean Energy Manufacturing Initiative uh, out at one of our uh, national labs, Oak Ridge National Lab uh, in Tennessee. Um, let, me, let me state what I think many of us know, which is that manufacturing really matters uh, in this country. It fuels 12% of our GDP. Uh, it continues to be a source of family-sustaining middle-class jobs. And it is essential uh, to the technological leadership of the nation, accounting for 70% of private sector R&D investment, 90% of patents issued, uh, and about 60% of exports. So this initiative uh, has two central objectives. One, to increase uh, US competitiveness in the production of clean energy products and to increase U.S. manufacturing competitiveness across the board by increasing energy productivity, whether by uh, developing platform technologies like carbon fiber uh, that can be used in multiple industries, uh, and or uh, particular technologies that increase efficiency in a number of different settings like combined heat and power. Um, and then let me tell you about our, our grid integration uh, initiative. We are rapidly approaching a time uh, when we will no longer be limited by the economics of clean energy technologies, but rather the ability of our electricity grid to accommodate the onboardings uh, of these new technologies. We're already encountering this, certainly in wind and solar, and will continue to encounter it. Uh, I mean, essentially, we need to figure out how to effectively integrate uh, renewable uh, energy technologies as well as energy efficiency technologies onto an outdated uh, and overburdened grid. Uh, and there are a number of ways, um, both on the technology side uh, and on the policy and deployment side, where we need to make improvements. And that's the, that is the intent of this initiative. And the, the, the final cross-cutting initiative I want to I want to tell you about is um, what we refer to as uh, EERE incubators. Um, at EERE, we have very well-defined technology roadmaps for our different technologies. Uh, I think that's one of our greatest strengths. Uh, but to be honest, it can also be a weakness uh, when uh, we get overly fixated on a particular roadmap and, and potential are slow to onboard new pathways that may come out of the blue and ultimately be superior to the pathways uh, of our existing roadmaps. So the incubator programs are meant to address this potential weakness. Uh, it, it, it devotes roughly 5 to 10 percent of each technology office's budget toward incubator programs that explicitly and only focus on pathways, technologies, and new approaches that are have not been supported in any meaningful way uh, by each office's current roadmap. Uh, the, the idea here is really to get out of the box a little bit um, and to be open to some new possibilities. Um, I, I've got a, a whole set of office by office slides here, but I think for the sake of time, uh, I will stop there and uh, we can address specific office questions that people have uh, in the QA. So thank you.
carefully look at that and also think about questions that we'll have for Jason uh, in, um, in, a, in a little bit. I'd now like to turn to Fred Sassine, who is with the Congressional Research Service at the Library of Congress. And Fred has uh, spoken at several of these budget briefings because he ends up being kind of a first-line resource for congressional offices uh, in terms of thinking about questions that offices have as, as they really look at what is happening on energy issues, energy technologies, what does this mean, how to interpret different things, always lots of questions with regard to the budget, what's the significance of that. And so uh, I'm very, very glad that Fred is with us again today to go through and look at sort of some of the highlights and themes and to put in context uh, a, a, a number of the areas of the Efficiency and Renewable Energy Budget that will provide some additional uh, context to what we've already heard Jason talk about a little bit. Fred? Thank you, Carol. Um, as all of you may know, CRS was established by law to be a non-biased and non-partisan policy research agency. Thus, I am required to make appropriate and dispassionate disclaimers before starting my comments. Hence, please know that despite any visual resemblance to the contrary, I am in no relation to any of the following media personalities. <laughs> TV newscaster Geraldo Rivera, <laughs> classic cowboy movie star Leo Carrillo, nor old time comedian Ernie Kovacs. A lot of you are too young to remember some of them. I'm trying to dispute that now. Some believe that we share a visual similarity, namely having a large nose. However, appropriate CRS fact checking shows the limitations of that. Perception. Nose size is not the only relevant factor. Mustache size is also a key factor. In fact, most studies we reviewed show that mustache size is clearly the most important factor. So now you know why I gave up on the idea of a career in stand-up comedy and decided instead for a more exciting career in congressional policy analysis. Okay, so let's get on with the rest of the CRS fact-checking. Everyone should have a hard copy of the slides in the presentation, and I will refer to the slides by number, which is shown in the bottom right-hand corner of each slide. Also note that some slides are shown with a dark blue background. Those are index slides, each of which lists a group of slides that follows immediately after it. So let's start with slide two, titled Outline, which provides an ordered list of the blue index slides, which can help you find different sections of the presentation. For example, slide three, a blue index slide, identifies the five slides in the overview section. So let's plow into this. Slide four on highlights stresses that FY13 estimates were not available. So FY12 is the baseline for all comparisons with figures in the FY14 request. It also shows that the proposed $1 billion increase for EERE accounts for more than half of the $1.8 billion total DOE increase. Slide five lists the administration's goals for cutting oil imports and for advancing U.S. leadership in global markets for clean energy equipment. <coughs> Slide six shows the key national interests addressed by EERE's clean energy focus, namely international competitiveness, climate change, and oil imports. Slide seven stresses that the budget comparisons, again, employ FY14 and FY12 differences and notes that many figures are rounded off for simplicity. Slide eight describes the four new groupings or themes of major program accounts that DOE employs in the FY14 request, namely sustainable transportation, energy efficiency, renewable electricity generation, and corporate management. 
Slide 9, a blue index slide, outlines the section on funding changes for each of the four themes. Slide 10 shows that DOE's sustainable transportation theme brings together the vehicles and bioenergy programs with a combined increase of $340 million. Slide 11 covers the major changes for the rest of the energy efficiency programs for which DOE seeks an increase of $464 million. Slide 12 lays out the $144 million increase for the rest of the renewable energy programs, which are focused primarily on electric power production. Slide 13 lists the increases for corporate management and in-house activities. This covers facilities, program direction, and strategic programs. Strategic programs are sometimes interesting. They're usually small amounts of money, but I think it's an area where DOE tries to lay the groundwork for doing some new things or new types of analysis. Slide 13 lists the increases, or sorry, slides 14 through 16 describe the major funding changes for specific programs. Note again that vehicles and manufacturing will get the largest share of the increases proposed for this new fiscal year. Slide 17, again a blue index slide, introduces the next section which provides a more detailed breakdown of specific program highlights. Each of these highlight slides covers both goals and funding. Slide 18, for example, notes that the vehicles program main priority is for plug-in electric vehicles to achieve parity with conventional cars. The largest funding increase is for battery and electric drive technologies, but also a smaller um, and hefty increase is sought for outreach and deployment. This request is similar to that which DOE proposed in FY13, but seeks a larger total dollar amount. Slide 19 shows the strategic elements and dollar increases for the manufacturing <coughs> program. The main increase is sought for a variety of advanced manufacturing facilities. This would be supported by a hefty increase for projects also. Notably, the relative shares of these two increases are nearly the inverse of the increases sought for FY13, where the larger share was, shot, was sought for projects and the smaller share was sought for facilities. Slide 20 on bioenergy shows goals for drop-in fuels, and algae fuels, and other liquid fuels. Again, there is a similarity to the FY13 proposal, but now there is an even greater funding emphasis on conversion technologies. Slide 21 breaks down the increase sought for buildings energy efficiency. The major increase would go to emerging technologies hardware, a definite change from the FY13 request. However, chunk would also go to fostering appliance efficiency standards. Slide 22 on solar energy identifies a six cents per kilowatt hour target for both types of utility scale technologies, that is photovoltaics and concentrated solar power which often goes by the acronym CSP, and in old parlance was called solar thermal. This request marks another change from FY13 with a greater emphasis now on CSP. Slide 23 covers the elements of the wind energy request. Energy production cost targets are set for both land-based and offshore wind equipment. Europe has been installing offshore wind farms for some time now, and there seems to be a growing domestic interest. Uh, I guess um, a lot of this is hinging on what comes out of the Cape Wind project, which has been on the burners now for about 10 years, I think. So that's one to watch for offshore wind. This request seeks more funding than DOE asked for in FY13. Slide 23 notes that funding is requested for two innovation hubs. Funding for the buildings hub would be a continuation of past support, while funding for the electricity hub would be a new startup. Also, DOE appears to be funding a critical materials hub linked especially to the manufacturing program, but there appears to be no line for this hub in the FY14 request. Um, I think DOE alluded uh, to the fact that it's funding it from some other source, but I'm, I'm not quite sure how that works. Uh, in your packet, there's also some additional reference material. Slide 26 
provides some background on innovation and demonstration projects for those who aren't familiar with them. The developmental gap between R&D and commercialization of technology poses some key financial risks for private companies. Demonstration projects try to help bridge that gap, but tend to be expensive, and thus they're often controversial in the budget process. Slide 27, one of the blue slides, introduces a section that provides some recent funding context for DOE R&D programs. Slides 28 through 30 provide selected single-year comparisons of funding for the four basic energy R&D programs, nuclear, fossil, renewables, and efficiency. Specifically, slide 28 presents the breakdown for FY11 appropriations. Slide 29 presents the breakdown for FY12 appropriations. And slide 30 shows the breakdown for the FY14 request. Slide 31 presents a pie chart that gives a visual picture of the breakdown for the FY12 appropriations. And for deeper context, slide 32 gives a long-term view of the relative funding shares for the four energy R&D programs. Slide 33, another blue slide, identifies key national interests that shape the framework of issues, which in turn creates the structure for most energy policy debates. Slide 34 lists some additional CRS resources that may be helpful to staff that have to work on these budget issues. And finally, one more CRS disclaimer. Many of you may know the famous American commentator, Will Rogers, when once asked about the extent of his knowledge on a particular subject, he famously remarked that, all I know is what I read in the newspapers. I am today in a directly parallel situation because all I know is what I read in the DOE documents. <laughs> so if you have any difficult or tricky questions about the EERE budget, please direct them to DOE's presenter, Jason Wall. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Fred. Um, and now I think you know why it's always very helpful to have somebody from the Congressional Research Service to, to work with, to help interpret issues and everything. And, and as Fred was going through that, and I was also looking at Jason's presentation, and I think it's really useful to kind of read those two presentations together, and I think that you will find putting those contexts together very, very helpful. So we're not going to take another look in terms of perspectives with regard to the budget. And, and uh, uh, what Scott is going to do is to provide yet another set of, of context that I think is very important for us to understand as we think of the whole role of energy and clean energy in our economy. Scott Sklar has been working in this policy area for decades, uh, which I know because unfortunately we've known each other for a very long period of time. And he is the president of the Stella Group, but he is also where he works a great deal in terms of thinking about the integration of technologies, both the integration of renewable technologies in terms of being hybrid systems, as well as the, the role of improved efficiency in bringing those, those systems into these kinds of hybrid uh, approaches, which I think is really critical as we think about how do we get the most out of our energy. And Scott is also the uh, chair of the Sustainable Energy Coalition on whose steering committee we both serve. Scott? Thank you. This is, uh, it's great to be here. Um, thank you very much. I'll see if this is for Oh, yes, it does. Excellent. I just want to make sure you understand what hat I'm wearing. I run a company that blends high value energy efficiency and renewable energy all over the world for primarily the commercial industrial sector and the US military. I'm also an adjunct professor at the George Washington University, teaching two interdisciplinary courses on sustainable energy and a seminar series at National Defense University. And as you know, I chair the steering committee. Um, I just want to again put energy in context and I used in my handout to you uh, both uh, Boyd Gray, former uh, pres uh, general counsel for, the, for President Bush, and former CIA director Jim Woolsey on the strategic issues of energy. 
remember, we are, we're so getting so thrilled that we have shale and natural gas deposits in the United States. All that means more is our allies, though, which are, are both our suppliers and our, our and most of the democracies in the world are stuck in the same hard situation that uh, we are now, but hopefully won't be in the future. Um, I also, if you took my classes, I would one of the things I stress in it is energy uses more water than food. Energy uses more water than food. All we have is 11 percent left for everything else we do, and while we're getting better per capita on less water use, uh, we actually have less water. And we're at the start of a 50-year drought, and as you all know, uh, changes in climate are going to impact negatively what water we have. So that is an issue that is sitting there as sort of the, uh, the, the line of the intent. Hey Scott. Yeah. Since you got such a big booming voice and you don't need that mic, maybe yes, it's rubbing against you. Yes, thank you. Um, that's right. My, my 19 year old daughter says she can hear me without a telephone. That's true. Um, and uh, I also want to just say again that greenhouse gases, uh, particularly carbon, are driven by the energy sector. So if you also took my course, you would understand, uh, you would be reading the 25 peer reviewed studies that have been done on renewable and energy efficiency over the last few years that show with commercial technology we have today, we could meet most or all of the world's or the United States energy needs with these resources. This is out of the DLL, DLA study that is the analytical group for Germany's NASA, showing we have 2,000 times more solar, 200 times more wind, 20 times more biomass, two times more geothermal, two times more uh, wave tidal, one times hydro, we have a ton of resource out there. Obviously, it's not all economic to harvest. Obviously, there are issues of getting it to the, to the end user. But you really, with that kind of resource base, you have very few, uh, you only have to get a few percent to, uh, to make your case. And I had my grad student interns take all those studies, poor kids, and read them, take the most um, conservative estimates from them. And just for the United States of America, if you wanted a, a hot, a energy efficiency renewable future, in fact, that would be the blend. And that's the conservative estimates. Um, 32 states, the Institute of Local Self-Reliance, uh, uh, did calculations show 32 states can be absolutely energy self-sufficient with the resources they have today and the technology we have today. All right. And then uh, the rest of the states, some of which are uh, high up there in the 80s, like New York, others are lower. And by the way, that does not include offshore wind or the wave or tidal technology. And that's how those southeast numbers uh, with offshore wind uh, would change rather dramatically. Um, I just, when I come up here and talk to members of Congress and staff, I always get this ridiculous whine about subsidies, somehow that the renewables and efficiency get them all. Uh, CRS and your, you had some good charts about that. That was rather staggering. But uh, we, we had a uh, uh, International Energy Agency as well as the G20 both made pronouncements that uh, the world has to start subsidizing fuels. Uh, this is the United States chart of fossil fuels, renewables, and biofuels uh, per year. Just so you know, per year out of the tax code. I spent a lot of time in that analyzing different pages of tax code. I hear this ridiculous fantasy that somehow the traditional fuels are not uh, uh, subsidized. This is the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists study, wonderful, showing 30 studies at meet up to 70 to 127 percent of a plant uh, for nuclear. Again, I'm not putting good or bad. I'm just trying to again get rid of the notion that it's the sufficiency of renewable stuff that gets subsidies. It's just not true. Just not true. So you've seen the chart on the budget request. By hand out, you can actually read this chart. My, my first thing to, to give you an overview is it's not only a good step up in public policy, it's actually a change within this administration. Every administration, Democrat or Republican, would throw some technology overboard to show Congress that somehow they were fiscally prudent. The problem with that, as you know, is 
that there's no one silver bullet. You need all these different technologies. This is the first budget where I've ever seen no technology got thrown overboard. So that, that's a, a very good first step. Uh, I'm not going through some of the drivers and success of these programs because my other um, didn't, but you know, obviously wind's going down in cost, photovoltaics are going down in cost. Um, EPRI has shown that we can meet 10% um, of our electric energy needs from tidal and wave technology. This is the first budget uh, request where we really have um, a, a solid increase in support by this administration in water energy technologies. This year was the first time in history we have had a, a tidal uh, deployment of, of electricity. I believe it's uh, 187 kilowatts off of Maine tied to the electric grid. We also have units now in the East River, which is a tidal river in New York, uh, producing power. So we're starting to see these technologies being commercialized, and now the Department of Energy is finally acknowledging that it is, it is a factor. I want to remind you, most people on this planet either live near the ocean or on rivers. So the energy source is right where the population is, and it's 24-hour power. So the potential is profound. So what's missing? My job is to talk to you about what's missing. What's missing is what I'll call integration within DOE. And this says congressional staffers, and I do believe, I want to be honest, I believe DOE wants to do this and has, has set some things in motion. But let's talk about this. Uh, you saw an increase in the budget request for advanced batteries and transportation. Well, you know, advanced batteries are needed on the, on the utility grid, dealing with variable technology for power quality. In my work for uh, the industrial sector and the military sector, we're a digital economy. What makes your power clean? Batteries have a lot to do with it. So it deserves multi- or interdisciplinary R&D. Uh, there are other kinds of storage other than batteries. Thermal salts for geothermal and solar thermal technologies are probably lower cost storage. Uh, Oak Ridge, that was mentioned before, is a leader in looking at compressed air and comp compressed lubricant storage. Uh, pumped hydro, of course. Uh, even hydrogen is really a storage technology that we, we tie to fuel cells. So we're playing around with all of it, but it's not being looked at comprehensively. And by the way, we do have an electrical energy systems program at DOE, which just focuses on utility scale. But there's a hell of a lot out there that's not utility scale. So the issue of how do we deal with this? Buildings is the same way. But if you look at the budget, they're looking at new advanced technologies. How about learning how to integrate elegantly the advanced technologies we already have? And yes, NREL does have an integration center being pulled together. But we really need to look at it now. We need our R&D to work with the industry so we have interconnection protocols like we have with computers. We've got to get this stuff in the real world working elegantly together, not just being nice components. That's my problem when I'm doing projects. It's a big deal. Uh, this is a... Uh, uh, Axion Power's one megawatt battery, carbon supercapacitor battery unit out in Pennsylvania for PJM. And uh, they are working with DOE on a new battery technology, and it's deployed. So we're starting to see these technologies in the real world. What's missing, uh, again, blending, looking at the smart grid R&D that's going on in DOE, the zero energy buildings that seems to be in the amorphous atmosphere within DOE, infrastructure security uh, within all this. These are all require an interface of different kinds of efficiency, storage, and renewable energy technology. This is very important for you to take a look at because this is important to the marketplace and to get the stuff out of research into real world use quicker. And, you know, the LED programs and other kinds of, uh, this is coal capital compact for us on the left, I mean, really was driven out of a lot of the DOE programs with the private sector. But now these need to be integrated into more smart uses. Solar daylighting uh, systems also came out of the DOE program. Electrochromic glass. We have this on the new GSA building. And I just finished a uh, zero energy building at the Washington Navy Yard, Naval Facilities Command. 
where we have this on that lightens or darkens, uh, reduces heat gain during the summer, all, and also reduces glare. What's missing three? Resource assessment. Carol and I have probably a 30 year history about whining about this capability. So we do have some of the labs that actually play in this area, but we need to transfer more of this and with other federal agencies, such as the National Weather <laughs> Service and NOAA, the Department of Commerce, so that we can start handing over to the private sector more detailed, precise ways that both end users, financers, and even component suppliers can show where their technologies have the greatest economic value. Having this kind of capability really drives it into the marketplace. We're getting there. This is three tier out of Seattle, 40 PhD hydrologists, oceanographers, meteorologists, and supercomputers. They can tell you anywhere on Earth where, what the solar insulation is, what the water regime is for hydropower, or where the wind is at the hub height. They can say, I did a project in Somalia, they can say at 87 feet, at that latitude longitude, there'll be enough wind for the turbine you want to use. In fact, the locals were shaking their heads at me saying, crazy America, there's no wind up there. Actually, it was plenty. And we have technology that can look at roofs of buildings and show you where the best sunshine is, where you want to put the solar all year long looking at things that may block the solar access. So the Department of Energy needs to has pieces of this, but needs to look at more comprehensively and tie it more to the private sector, if you want to accelerate deployment. Um, homeland security is a big issue. I'm involved in it using these technologies. That's a solar street light. They have been pushing very well to do this kind of stuff, but we need more interagency cooperation between DHS, DOE, and DOD so that we get some of these technologies to solve our security and homeland security problems together. That's my zero energy office building in North Arlington uh, with solar PV roofing shingles, wind turbine, hydrogen fuel cell, electrochromic class, all this stuff. You are all invited. I have two zero energy buildings. And I just want to end this saying, good planets are hard to find. This is all we got. So I'm counting on you to, to be vigilant on these programs because this is how we make our nest a little more habitable. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Scott. So let's open it up for any questions or comments you have of any of the speakers. And if any of the speakers also want to comment about things that you said. Okay, we'll start here and then we'll work our way around. And just if you could identify yourself, please. Yes, my name is Dan Gray. I'm ASME Congressional College. Uh, Jason, you must know that the, we're spending 40% more money than we have and take in, and you want to increase it 40 more percent. You must have not got the message that we're spending more than we have. Is that DOE's total picture for all their departments? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, no. Uh, we have a longer conversation conversation about how much revenue we bring in uh, versus what we get back from investments. I, I will say that if we're talking about investments, we need to also talk about the returns on those investments. Right? Uh, I showed you some of the data uh, that we've got. We've got a lot more that shows very significant ROIs for a lot of our investments in technologies. I, mean, I know that the uh, investments we made in trucking combustion that yielded a return of about 75 to 1 uh, compared to uh, what we put into it. I noted the investments of our solar technology office, uh, which have yielded uh, an ROI of about 5 to 1. So, I mean, to my mind, uh, what's really expensive uh, is sticking with an energy system we currently have uh, that is over, overly reliant on uh, dirty sources, uh, overly reliant on uh, foreign sources, and enormously damaging uh, to our people's health uh, and to the long-term sustainability of the climate. Uh, so there are a number of different ways of accounting here. Uh, you offer one, I'll offer another, I'm sure others can offer their own. Okay, um, we'll go back here first, go ahead. Hi. Um, just picking up Scott on your last question, my name is Lisa Wright, I'm a former congressional staffer. Could you give a little more elaboration on changes 
with respect to coordination and collaboration between DOD and DOE and DHS and perhaps USDA because there are Yes, I'm glad you raised USDA. Of understanding that are a couple well, of years Right. I mean, yeah, first, to, to, to be clear, there are some existing collaborations between both the last administration and this administration with DOE and DOD uh, and USDA on biofuels, for instance. And uh, there are some even some strategic interfaces. I'm really talking about more focused and, um, and more detailed. Right now, generally, the way DOE works with DOD is they sort of allow the labs to, to be uh, seconded for special little projects like net zero energy bases. That's fine, but that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about looking at a strategic issue, power quality, cybersecurity, for instance. Uh, this is a very important issue, not just on our grid, but on our military bases. One of the ways to resolve that, by the way, is just redundancy. have a lot of stuff out there, so if your cell towers go down with the grid, you have uh, renewable generation. I'm doing a lot of renewable generation all over the world at cell towers. And they're not tied to computer networks, so they're just working, you know. And, but there, so there needs to be a more uh, strategic play in that interaction. And right now, I call it a uh, warm and fuzzy play. And, or ad hoc, uh, as you said. Or more ad hoc, yeah. And I, I think, and I really believe that really has to come from Congress. I really have to, to, to say, here are the five or six strategic issues we're looking at. And, th and we want you to narrow down. We just don't, we don't want huggy, good feeling things. We really want you to take very tight nuggets of activity and work on it for 18 months and then get out of it and maybe move to the next thing. So that's my suggestion. Um, so I'm Bill Parsons with Congressman Ben Allen. I have one question for Jason and then for the second for the group. Um, Jason, you want to speak to the question Fred asked about? He said it seemed like there may be an effort to, to fund a critical materials hub, but he couldn't find a light item and so forth. Do you like clarify that question he was raising? And the uh, second, and then just I'll just put the second one down and then I'll shut up. Um, I was really struck by the um, the underinvestment, you know, uh, graph that you had, and I I could guess at some of the answers to that, but if any, you guys can just speak briefly to why you think there's there's such a significant private sector underinvestment in this space. Uh, one of the advantages of coming here is to actually have CRS look at your, your uh, congressional justification, your budget numbers. I, I actually didn't know we didn't have a line for our critical materials hub. Uh, it, it is in our budget. Uh, so, Fred, I'll follow up with you. <laughs> I just didn't see it, but we don't have a full budget request yet either. Okay. Uh, but thank you for, for spotting that. Um, on the issue of underinvestment, I, you know, I, th I think it's a much longer conversation. Uh, you know, certainly where you start, I think, is noting that in the energy sector, um, you know, we're talking about big amounts of money. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, any kind of capital investment is, is going to require uh, a large amount of money. And I think that, that um, uh, is a disincentive uh, to invest in innovation. We also have a business model. Particularly in the utility sector, that is highly regulated uh, and that um, um, has a number of disincentives, I think, toward innovation. Um, there are probably a number of other reasons as well. Yeah, and if I could just add to it, we, we, in fact, in energy, the whole reason we're trying to do what we're doing here today is to give choice in the market. And if you really look at it, and I don't want to make it too simplistic, we have an oil, fossil fuel choice for vehicles, and we have a sort of a traditional central station choice on wires for consumers for electricity. That's our play. So you have to really work with those two intermediaries and their delivery systems. So why do they really want to innovate? They really have it sort of a centralized, comfortable system. And which is what we had with telephones. So when you all of a sudden change the rules and have more access of different kinds of technology into the system, you have more consumer choice <coughs> and has revolutionized communications. That's really what we're trying to do here, that everybody will have an option to either get the lowest cost energy, the greenest energy, the most reliable energy, the cleanest energy, the most domestic energy, and let the consumer decide. That's really what this long-term play is about. But the system we have now discourages investment in R&D because 
Why? I'm making oil. I got plenty of it. I got the best delivery system in the world, or I'm a utility. I do the same thing. So we need to. We're, we're, we're trying to change the rules of the game here. Obviously, we're just getting some of our uh, slapped around to do some of that. But in the end, it's going to be good for the consumer. Frank, do you have a thought on that question? Uh, why such a low investment rate in the private sector? Uh, I haven't really looked at that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it, and. It, I mean, we've been seeing this for a long time, that there's been that kind of underinvestment, I think, compared to, to other things. And I know just in terms of having observed a lot of hearings up here on the Hill where I, it's been very clear that the private sector has not seen the interest in terms of taking that um, uh, purported risk. And obviously, if you are highly profitable doing what you're doing, why, why uh, change? Uh, the power of the status quo is very important. Fred. I can come back a little bit to Dick's yeah. question. Um, I haven't looked at it in a broad way, but one piece I have looked at is the electric utility system. And I think somebody somebody was alluding to the fact that um, there's a tendency to invest in energy efficiency there. And that's because electric utilities were designed to profit from selling other number, greater numbers of kilowatt hours. Uh, there are a lot of ex experiments that have been going on for many years now in different states about how to change that system, but it takes kind of a complicated regulatory approach. You have to address three key factors, which I don't know this is the best time to go into that in detail, but you have to recover the program costs, you have to decouple that long-term regulatory structure that makes sales to profits. And then you have to give an equivalent incentive to energy efficiency that's equivalent to power plants on the supply side. Yeah. So it's a, it's a complex kind of regulatory thing, and that's just for energy efficiency, just with electric utilities. You know, so um, I, I know it exists, but it's not something I've said in great detail for the renewables and so forth. Um, okay, we'll come back here first, and we've got several other people. I think the EERE uh, vision and goals are admirable. However, uh, what I don't see is what is your near-term solution for people in counties and cities and towns that have budget problems that need to be addressed today over the next two decades. Your problem doesn't solve that, or your, your vision and your goal don't solve that. Uh, a 25 cent rise in the price of the gasoline uh, causes major problems in the budgets. Uh, and there are solutions that are being implemented in Europe, not here in the States, like micro refineries. I just don't see that being portrayed as a near-term solution? Well, it's, it's, it is difficult uh, to balance uh, more long-term R, B, and E um, that, by definition, is kind of playing the long game, right? Uh, with addressing uh, very immediate challenges that people face, whether of the budgetary kind or, or any other kind. Um, you know, I did know that a part of our mission is to break down market barriers, um, particularly in areas where technologies have actually reached the deployment phase. Um, that is particularly true in the building sector, where there are a, a number of market barriers that are inhibiting the, the, the growth of the energy efficiency sector. But it, increasingly, as, as renewable technologies um, uh, scale up, it's, it's, it's happening in, in areas like solar and wind. As an example, uh, and I'll use just this as one example that addresses your question, I mean, we have worked very, very hard to reduce solar technology costs. And through a lot of hard work uh, of many different actors, solar technology costs <coughs> have dropped by roughly 75% over the last four years. Um, however, the soft costs uh, that uh, are everything to do with, with, with everything that is not technology, uh, many of which are driven by what is 
essentially a patchwork of policies across the country with respect to interconnection and siting and permitting. Those costs have not gone down uh, to, to the point where those costs are, are actually uh, even slightly above the technology costs if you look at, at the right. entire thing. So in, in the near term, we are working with state and city and county government, governments to figure out ways in which we can reduce those costs, often via public policy and regulation, uh, by making standards more consistent, by pursuing best practices. It is not a silver bullet solution. It's a lot of hard work. Uh, nonetheless, it's working at that kind of a level uh, that is our way of addressing the stuff that's, that's right in front of us here and now uh, in terms of the deployment challenge. Hey, Jason, I, I think I have a different answer because I um, am hired by state and local governments on this. The DOE program has worked with uh, uh, bus manufacturers for electric buses. They finance their electric buses. It's, it's a dollar and a half a gallon, and we have a lot of municipalities starting to use them. And, and, and it's astounding because the cost of running school buses are profound. Um, they have worked analytically with industry on these what I'll call industry finance solutions. Instead of a municipality coming and paying for the stuff out of their budget, they'll say they'll use power purchase agreements or energy service uh, contracts or leasing, and all their and they're just paying out less than they would pay for their utility, and all of a sudden have on their building or at a facility or at their park a system that provides long-term and stabilized energy costs. And we couldn't have gotten it through the financial system had not the DOE analysts worked with us to make it more transparent. So they are actually doing it, um, and, and then there are practitioners like myself that actually have to go out and translate that so the local company can understand it. Yeah, I think there are a variety of things that are happening, and I've read if I understand your question correctly, sir, um, uh, a few things came to mind. Uh, if you're familiar with the Recovery Act of 2009, mm -hmm. uh, one of the initiatives in that was the Energy Efficiency Block Grant Program. I think that was about $3 billion. Yeah. And a lot of that was focused for that type of application for state and local. Uh, and also, um, energy conservation bonds. I think there was uh, maybe a billion dollars worth of authority there, which a similar kind it's of still there. a lot of broad applications. Uh, and also the state local grant program, which is under the ERE, generally year to year it's fell a fairly small amount, but there was a one time big chunk in the recovery act for that as well. I think another two billion dollars or so that was really focused on state local governments. And if I'm correct, there is a new program that the administration proposed in the FY14 budget. It's not under EERE. Uh, it's called Race to the Top for Energy Efficiency and Grid Modernization. And they're asking for about $200 million. And it says uh, one time funding that challenges states, tribes, and local governments, uh, blah, 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 to cut energy and waste and modernize the grid. So there is a proposal in the current budget begins for about $200 million. Good job, Fred. Well, well, on the top of it. Fred did miss the, the long-term authorization program administered by DOE, which again had a huge boost during the um, recovery um, uh, package, but, but that number has um, increased in this budget as well, which if you look at Jason's slides, you will see. And again, it, one of the things that I think is so interesting about that program is that it is actually, while it is delivering uh, important efficiency services to homes. At the same time, it has actually also helped drive technology development and the whole residential energy efficiency retrofit business, which again allows the leveraging of technology and jobs across the country well beyond the, the immediate sector served by that program. So there are a whole lot of things that that really do uh, make a difference, and obviously we don't. You know, we can all see lots of opportunities or things that would be great to to get addressed. And um, and what's the best way to leverage those resources? Ms. Carol, this is Carol mentioned that I will say on the weatherization program. This is a program that weatherized over a million homes uh, from 2009 to early 2013, and by our best estimates, that will save households over the over of the natural life of their home, roughly $7 billion in energy costs, which is a significant chunk of income. Okay. Uh, one other is uh, uh, not existing, but a proposal by the administration, I think it was last year, the year before, for a home 
here. Um, my name is Doug Taylor. I think, Scott, this is a question for you. You mentioned about things that are missing maybe from the budget. You talk about integration within the mm -hmm. DRE budget. Maybe going a little higher to the overall DOE budget, do you see integration of energy systems as an area where DOE is not really looking into, say, for example, would you integrate uh, wind energy with coal or fossil nuclear in some way? That well, they have within DOE the electric energy systems <coughs> budget, which is not within EERE, and that's the role of that program. And, and frankly, that program has really changed from even five years ago, which was sort of a play thing into a much more integrative thing. But again, it's just focused, it is focused on the grid, both grid management and bringing in the larger generation and the technologies to better understand how to do it. And I think actually on that one will be one of the few things where I think DOE's done very well on integration. Well, maybe not just integrating on the grid, but let's say you're combining the technologies into like a single well, they are also trying to deal with in that program understanding the variable, what I'll call variable renewables, wind and solar, and how you train uh, grid operators to better understand it, and what's the what's the learning curve on that. No, I actually think that they they do that reasonably well. Uh, Scott Scott mentioned uh, this, so I'll just elaborate on a little bit. Part of our budget request is, is twenty million dollars for. Energy Systems Integration Facility, our National Renewable Energy Lab in Northern Colorado, which is a really a first of its kind facility that allows megawatt scale R&D uh, and testing uh, of components and strategies required to bring multiple clean energy technologies onto the grid, essentially in flight, uh, at scale and at speed. Uh, this is a facility that we're going to do the groundbreaking on. August, um, one that we're really excited about, one that uh, the private sector has already signed up to do their testing at. So, so from an integration standpoint, we think that's going to be a really critical resource. And it allows a lot more leveraging of resources and everything, too. Fred, do you want to If I understand your question correctly, sir, um, <laughs> one thing that comes to mind, I'm not in the industry like Scott or close to it like DOE, but um, I know I've read about co-firing coal plants with biomass, and I think you can do maybe up to 20%. And, and the program has done some uh, funding uh, with that. With that, but um, I don't know if you were also asking, like, in a, a more confined setting, if you're off grid on an island or somewhere, to have a complete system. Uh, in an ideal case, you might have a wind machine and uh, solar, but then you'd want something like a fuel cell, you know, so that you've got power at night and when the wind's not blowing. Uh, those kind of systems, I know they've been looked at. Um, I haven't really paid any attention to them since the late, late 1980s when I did a paper or two. Thousands of installations. But, but uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of learning since then on that. But I don't know if that's what you would yeah, kind of off-grid stuff. Yeah, like uh, how would you maybe link them together for greater efficiency? Yeah, I mean, DOE's looking a little, again, they're much more grid-oriented than off-grid-oriented, sadly. And, um, but we have, you know, these microgrids can be not tied to a larger grid, and, and we're doing that. Department of Defense is doing that. We've done several uh, microgrids, some, one of which is in Afghanistan right now, and they're working very well, and it's looking at, uh, you know, inter interfacing about 14 different technologies, generation, storage, and end-use technologies. And so it's, it's a pretty exciting time. We're just in the beginning of this one. It's going to be fun. Do you have more questions? Yeah, we do. We have several. Go ahead, Brad. I'm sorry. Brad Penny with Advocates of the Other America. We were encouraged by the increase in the weatherization ask to one be four million. Part of that is a $24 million set aside for finance mechanism for multifamily housing weatherization. A very laudable goal. Multifamily has not received the emphasis in the program that it should. The question is, how is that going to be? I understand it's going to be competitive, but is DOE going to issue regs on that? It seems a weatherization, a, a, a more complicated uh, finance mechanism. How is that going to play out? Uh, the short answer is I don't know, Brad, but, but let me get back to you on that. Okay, good. Here and then here. Go ahead. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, could you identify yourself? Yeah, my name is Amanda. I work for Congress and Movies. Um, and I was wondering.
Well, some of the states are leading, and, and that's not, and, and of course California is one of them, but not just California. On decoupling, for instance, Michigan could, could be the lead. On uh, grid integration of distributed renewables, New Jersey. So, and there are organizations, uh, uh, National Council of State Legislators, National Association of State Energy Officials, uh, the International, uh, sorry, the, uh, the Interstate Renewable Energy uh, Council, are, are three of them that, that track sort of the state and local government side of it. ICLE, which is the, I don't know what the ICLE stands for, it's the International Municipalities for Climate, but they do a local uh, government um, ones. But if you grab my card, again, I have a list of all that stuff, and I'm happy just to send you the list, because I, I get my grad students to look at just that all the time. Okay, great. Uh, if I understand your question correctly, um, the states have been labs that basically for experimental and innovative policies for renewable energy and energy efficiency for decades. In fact, uh, historically, um, states were the sole or main province for energy policy making. It was only in the 1970s when we uh, started to feel national vulnerabilities to oil imports that the federal government really started to get into energy policy in a big way. So they've always been there. And some of the interesting examples of that um, are probably with the appliance efficiency standards, uh, where, um, I don't know, California was one of the leaders, but I know there's a handful of other states that have been leaders in this too. And they wanted to do more with energy efficiency and appliances, and they have the right to establish standards. And uh, uh, at some point, that would drive the manufacturers crazy because suddenly you have three or four different standards in different states. So manufacturers who may have opposed the national standard would then come running to the federal government and ask for something uniform <laughs> because they were having to deal with this patchwork quilt. And every couple of years, some state would come up with a different standard and they'd have to keep retooling the product lines to deal with it. So um, I hope that's We have that now in an interconnection for small renewables where we have 42 states with interconnection standards are all different. So the inverter manufacturers have to produce different inverters. Imagine having to produce a different refrigerator for every state. You know, it's just ridiculous. And we've been trying to get a national approach to homogenization of that so we could standardize equipment. It would change the market, lower the cost. So there's a lot of issues like this. But, but Fred's right. The states and local governments, municipalities, certain counties, have done amazing things in this area. Yes, and if you're looking for something specific, if you haven't already looked at it, you should look at the uh, desired online database because it has all of the yes. policy uh, all the policies in place, state, local, and utility level, uh, um, and it has the federal in a kind of separate category there, but you can troll around and you can search it. There's a nice search engine where you can look up appliance standards and then see what each of the states have given the appliance standards.
that that MOU, which at the time was, was rather, it was considered rather you know, exciting and groundbreaking, but, um, has, has that been optimized? Um, is, it, is, are, are the, is the work being executed in the DOD space, uh, the BDG programs, and the energy and energy renewable energy programs, all kinds of stuff, now. is it in alignment with DOE's efforts? Is it duplicative? Or is no, it's not that? duplicative. I, I think your, that MOU between the agencies was an amazing first start. It has had some amazing benefit to both sides, uh, opening DOE to the understanding of what are some of the mission needs relating to defense that uh, DOD has, and also giving more brain power uh, to, in terms of technology specificity to DOD, whose labs are really not energy labs, they're, they're uh, security and defense uh, equipment labs. So, uh, so it, it, it has been very valuable. Um, it's, really, it's really good, and actually, my, my instinct on this would be for Congress to say, you need to do more of that, but what we want is a little more focus and a little more um, uh, looking at some of, the, some of these short-term security needs and, 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 and just help drive the turnover and make it a little more transparent. I, I think that's exactly the kind of things needed, by the way, between all the, all the agencies. And DOD and USDA, for instance, with the, with the fuel side, same thing. We need, if you want biofuels, you need to have a supply chain. USDA is really good. They have the best labs on supplies, on biomass supplies in the world. Um, you know, DOE is really good, and this move to drop in fuel is fabulous because you don't need a whole new infrastructure to have create biofuels that can be used in any existing engine that we need. So that's great. And then obviously, DOD is going to say. You know, if we're looking at it for us, it's, you're not going to supply bomb fuels for our planes. We use more, too much of that. But where we have a theater of war operation where, you know, Pakistan says you can't fly stuff over. You know, can we put in deployable units with what we have and do technology? Uh, we can do all that stuff, but we've got to have some focus on it. Some national will and some congressional support bipartisanly because I think some of the anger at the Navy particularly, that isn't partisan, has been um, that, uh, you know, this is a very expensive dollar per gallon. The issue is not the dollar per gallon, the issue is options. We want to make sure we have options, just what we talked about earlier. This provides an option. Well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's our view that, that it's a tremendously exciting MOU and one we can do more with. Um, we actually, my boss, Dave Danielson, is assuming the co-chairmanship um, of that partnership uh, with that intent. Um, there's a lot we can do here that we're already doing. I mean, uh, Scott mentioned the drop in biofuels that we're working on with, with DOD. There's a lot we can do on the financing side as well. I mean, I, you know, it, it's important to recognize that the purchasing power of DOD brings with it tremendous first market opportunity. And they're also the only federal agency that, that is able to enter into the 30-year power purchase agreement. And, and they often don't have the expertise that, that folks within the FEMP have, which is within the ER. And we've been working with them in a very intentional way uh, to, to really take advantage of I don't, it's George? Yes. I don't have an answer for you, but I have a resource person, a terrific person at CRS. Her name's Kate Blakely. And if you give me your business card before you go today, uh, I can have a give you a call. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I would also just mention, in terms of thinking about the MOU with uh, DOD and DOE, another whole terribly important area, um, I think, is with regard to buildings and facilities, uh, where there is a lot of work underway um, between the two agencies which I think as we have all seen over the last couple years, that that is becoming ever more important in terms of thinking about the resilience we need to build in to our built infrastructure, in terms of our buildings, in terms of dealing with uh, some of the really horrific um, storms of weather extremes that we're seeing so that we can both get facilities up much more quickly and hopefully literally weather the storm in a more resilient way. Um, and so it provides an opportunity for those agencies to really bring a lot of technologies and deployment skills together. Um, other, any last question? Okay, over here. Uh, 